So first of all, welcome everybody for tonight's uh, event, our first one with Waves Audio. We're very excited to work with Waves. They've been in st a standout in the industry since the 90s. I think Waves was one of the first plugins that engineers, mix engineers, started to use seriously in the box, I think it's fair to say. Before, before Waves, nobody was really using plugins. They were still not quite good enough. I will start with my first masterclass, and I'll focus on some part of my workflow and how to get an analog kind of vibe in using in-the-box systems. With engineers working in the box, we've all discovered techniques that we had to replicate all the techniques we used to use with hardware, and we've all found our ways of getting that sound within the box, if you like. So I'm going to hide that for now. So the session I've chosen is a track that our students have recorded. It's a massive attack track. It's a classic track from the 90s. As part of the advanced recording and mixing module on, uh, on our degree, if any of you are in year three and already going through that module, you will go through a, a session where you record string session. So slightly different techniques, different miking techniques. Everything is recorded there. So that, that deconstruction was mostly done with students. So I'll just play you a little bit of the, of the track. You will recognize it, hopefully. Like a soul without a mind In a body without a heart I'm missing every part Like a soul without a mind In a body without a heart So you all know this track. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you through roughly. So just for a bit of history, which I thought would be interesting, that track was mixed in a recording studio where both Rob and I have spent many, many years uh, in that room. So we know it pretty well inside out. And that's the room. So that track was mixed in that studio here, Studio 2 at Matrix in central London, which has been closed for a long time now. All of us as engineers have worked in, in, in those rooms. So. I've got a pretty good idea of what was used for the, for the mixing. It was mixed on an SSL E-series, going to tape back in the days, because that was how things were done. With all the classic hardware from 1176, LA-2As, Eventide, Lexicon, plate reverbs, etc., etc. So what I wanted to do was try to recreate a little bit of that feel, if you like. One of the main plugins, and if I had one plugin to have from Waves, I really wanted to make that thought about if there was only one plugin I could have. I think it's fair to say I've totally fallen in love with the NLS summing. And I'm going to show it to you here. Well, it's one instance of it. The idea is to simulate it's a summing in the box. So you put it on as many channels as you want, and then you have it on your master bus, as you can see here. The way the summing works is it has three desk modeled. So you've got a classic SSL from Spike, which is a, a G-series. Then you've got the Mike Hedges EMI desk, which is a classic desk as well. And uh, Neve from Yoad, Nevo. So you can choose those three simulations. The idea of using that kind of summing is to add a bit of coloration to your sound. And they really come on their own, I think, when you start driving them. I think the, what I really like about that summing is the drive here, that, that button here. It's, it has a nice drive. I find it really musical, personally. And the way to use that system is basically, as you will see on my master class here, on my session, every single channel is put on the last instance as a plugin. So the idea is that you've got all your signal. It goes into the desk. I've gone over the top. I've put it on every single channel uh, just to illustrate for that purpose. And then on the master fader, the way to do it is you've got two instances. One is called channel, the other one is called bus. That is the bus, and the idea is you put that first on your master bus, and everything is summed here. So for any of you who are familiar with SSL, and you will see it on the duality, for example, the SSL is known for these eight VCA faders, which are great because you quickly create eight stems. You bus all your drums, your strings. So what I've done here, as you can see, I've bust all my drums to VCA1, all my strings on two, piano on three, etc. That means very quickly I can start judging levels. I can start rebalancing things just with the stems. So that's one approach that I like to use. On top of that, I also drums all my bus. So all my drums are going to that bus, and we can listen to it now, just the drums. <laughs> Like 
have put again to keep the whole idea of the SSL since it was mixed on an SSL board. I've put SSL channels, I've using exclusively the channel strip, the SSL, the E series, because that was an E series originally it was done on. So all my EQ and basic compression I've done using the SSL channel. And then all the drums are going group into a bus, this one. I've put a little bit of the Kramer tape just to get a bit of that sound, a bit of saturation, harmonic distortion. See, it gets a little bit bigger. It, it, it has a little bit of saturation that, that gives you that warmth. It makes also the top end slightly less harsh. And, and that's, by definition, a lot of the analog characteristic if you, if you like. Why a lot of people are into the analog sound? It's because analog gives you a bit of magic. It's a bit random, it's less precise than digital, it affects the transient, it's based on different type of components, electronic components that give that kind of sound. All those kind of imperfection, if you like, that we used to complain back in the 90s sometimes about the noise, the tape noise, you know, we used to fight it all the time, having to use gates and stuff. But now we are discovering that actually there's something quite musical and quite pleasant about it. So that's what I've done on the drums. And then I'd like to focus on the strings. So as you know, the strings were recorded here. It's a fairly small room. You know, it's a small, it's a normal control room, great for drums, you know. But obviously, ideally, when you record string, and the original strings were recorded at Abbey Road Studio One, which is probably one of the most famous live room in the world. Uh, that's where Indiana Jones, Star Wars and <laughs> were recorded. You know, it's known for the huge sound for the strings. So Massive Attack recorded their string section for that track in Studio One. So inevitably, we're not going to compete, you know, as much as we've got a really good studio, but it's not Studio One in Abbey Road, you know, just in terms of space. So I thought, how can we get a little bit of that? So I'm going to play you first the four direct mag that, was, that were used. So it was a quartet, two violin, viola, and cello. So let's have a listen on their own. So those are the four strings. And then we added a bit of low end because we wanted that really fat sound and that really helps to make the whole thing sound already a lot bigger. Those are a couple of mic rooms that we have in the room, some ribbon mic and some more further away. So that helps also bringing that ensemble. You know, the whole point about strings is if you listen to one string on its own and put your ear next to it, it doesn't sound that pleasant. You need a bit of distance. So when you're recording strings, you apply the same. You don't stick a mic just close to it, you know. In Recording pop music, a lot of it is done with close miking these days. But for strings, you want that kind of ensemble further away. So the room is really vital to get that feel in terms of the tone, and also it helps the pitching. So what I've done now in terms of starting to simulate a bigger room is this. So the first, I, I thought, we need a really bigger room here. We need some mic in the room. So I'm using the plate Tiabi Road Chamber. So again, the chamber room in Abbey Road, before reverb existed, before artificial reverb, before the, the plate, before the, the spring, and then the digital boxes, before that in the 50s, the only way to get reverb was put the further away you put your mic from the source, the more room you hear, okay? And then engineers w thought oh, it would be great to have some kind of more control over that. And the next reverb were chamber rooms. Chamber rooms were literally speakers in a dedicated room, quite reverby room, and that were mic'd up. And then you would send that, the sound into the speakers, the mic would pick up the sound from the speakers, that would become your reverb. And suddenly you had a bit more control with the direct source and the reverb sound. So I thought, let's use that. And the Abbey Road Chambers room are, are, are very famous for their distinctive sound, you know, I mean, the Beatles and etc. etc. So I'm using that room to recreate a little bit of that. So let's have a listen what we're getting here now. So that's the chamber. 
there's not as much top end because I wanted to create something a bit more dull. I wanted the simulation of a mic a bit further away because I had enough of the top end going on with all my individual mic. So I think that works pretty well in combination. So now, if we start, that's the Abbey Road. So now, let's put, as part of our string, just the Abbey Road plugin into it and see the difference it makes. That's without. So you see, the, the reason I wanted that kind of slightly duller sound from the room was to get a bit of body into, because by nature, a big, a big orchestra is going to have a bit more body just because of the number and, and, and in a big room. So I think that's helping a lot in, in achieving that. Again, Abbey Road invented this thing called artificial double tracking that was invented by Ken Townsend when he was recording the Beatles. The story is that John Lennon was asked the, the engineers at Abbey Road, can you create an automatic double tracking so I don't have to re-sing every part? John Lennon was a big fan of doubling his voice, but eventually it's time consuming to re-sing exactly the same part. So he asked the engineers at Abbey Road, could you devise, design a device that can do that? And Ken Townsend at the time came up with the idea using two tape machines, the sync head, the repro head, which was really innovative at the time. And it had become a feature sound of a lot of recording, especially down at Abbey Road. And luckily, Waves have redesigned that plugin, which I've got to say, I was really excited when that came out because a lot of the time you receive multi-track to mix and you wish, I wish the vocal was double tracked. Uh, and that suddenly gives you this kind of double tracking. Because when it comes to double tracking, you don't want something perfect all the time. You want, you know, two performances are going to be slightly before, slightly after. The pitch is going to be slightly different. So Waves have recreated the whole ADT process uh, in that plugin. So that's ADT. One side is the source, the other one is the fake double tracking. As, as you can see, the very speed here, it's controlled by a small LFO that I've put at a fairly low amount. And you see here, the thing that's moving, that's making this LFO moving. So that means things are going to move before, after. The pitch is going to change slightly. So let's have a listen to um, that plugin. And if we start putting it now with the chamber, And when you start adding that to all the original signal, you see the strings, how much bigger they've become already now. Combination of double tracking, combination of kind of simulated bigger room. There's another thing that strings love, reverb. I don't know if any of you know what it is. It was the first electromechanical reverb, but in terms of it, the system was electromechanical in the sense that there was very little component that was the first kind of, not digital, but the first reverb as a box, if you like. They're so good, they generate some very interesting harmonics, and they work so well for strings and piano especially. So this simulation is very accurate, and it gives you four different plates. Each plate, because they're built with wood and it's all materials, not two plates have the same sounds. Some plates are duller, some plates are brighter. Some, you know, that's the beauty of, of the instrument. And often recording studios would, would have two or three different plates and you would kind of send and see what works best in your mix. Now, hopefully, now obviously, you've got it just here. You can change the you know, plate one and two. So let's have a listen to what the plate brings because that's probably the bigger thing in terms of what it brings to these strings sounds. That's without the plate. And you hear the tail, it's a lovely, this, this lovely tail. So what I love about those is the plate creates some harmonics and again, it's really quite sympathetic to the strings and, and, and they work really well and, and eventually you're getting that sound. So now, I, I'd like to believe it sounds more than just four, four people in a room. Sounds 
And again, I went for a fairly long time on, on those because the nature of this track requires that, you know, the, that, that the original mix is quite wet in the sense there's a lot of going on. It's part of the sound of the, of the whole journey on the, on, on the song, if you like. And finally, I'll show you my, my vocal workflow. I've kept it pretty straightforward. I, I've worked a lot with the engineer who mixed the final track, so I know that he's, he was never so keen on parallel. There's so many parallel processing. Some people like to parallel, heavy compress, and then start to balance against the direct sound. But I, I know that engineer just like to use insert and, and getting it shaping the sound in that way. So just to get a bit of what I wanted on that mix, I'm using the J37. It's the EMI Studer back in the days, I believe, from Abbey Road. Again, that's the four track that the Beatles were used to record on. And I wanted that kind of sound. Again, tape can help with vocal. The kind of takes away the harshness, brings a natural compression. And uh, I quite like if I can achieve that without hitting compressors too hard. So I've got that on the vocal. And then I've got, the again, an SSL channel with a fast attack just to get rid of the quick peaks, just to even out the performance a little bit. And then before I go to the next, I'm going into another compressor. It's a simulation of the LA2A. It's a slower compressor. It's more of a leveler uh, that works great on vocal and bass, especially a lot of engineers would use them for, those, for this purpose. And having two compressors on the signal is, is, is really not unusual at all. In mixed situation, often on vocals, I would end up with three or four, all of them doing a little bit, but by the end of it, achieving what you want, instead of doing too much with one. Because each compressor has their own characteristic. I, I, I feel compressors are like EQ. Sometimes you're going to put a compressor because you know what it does to the top end or what it does to the bottom end. And then I've got the Puig Tech. Again, it's a Pool Tech Classic EQ. One of the main features of the Puig Tech that I'd like to talk to you about is the possibility to boost and attenuate the same frequency. You see those two knobs here, the boost and attenuate. And some people are always kind of wonder why do you attenuate and boost the same frequency. It creates an interesting curve. You're boosting it, and, and it just creates that kind of curve, which is really quite musical. And it's a well-known technique with the, with the pool tech that many engineers use. And also, the pool tech is known for its really lo lovely top end. So I'm adding a bit of 12K to the vocal just to get a bit of that breathing, if you like. I've got a DS, uh, and then again, going into the channel. And the vocal's got its own dedicated plate, because plate reacts in a certain way. And if you send too much stuff into a plate, it can start becoming confusing. And also, I wanted the plate for the reverb to sound slightly differently from, from the strings. So I've ended up using two different plates. However, you will notice that I don't use that many reverbs. I use a couple of digital reverb here, the R from the Renaissance, which has just been repackaged. So you may have seen it. It's a lovely digital reverb that I really like. You know, you can really shape it. Another reverb that I really like as well is the H reverb. You can craft so much with that reverb. I mean, yeah, if you look at all the parameters, you really can get it into that sound. And I'm using those two reverb to kind of recreate what would have been used on the mix, which were probably some lexicon. PCM 70, 480. They were the classic in the 90s as digital boxes. So I'm using them on the drums, literally for the kick and snare, just to recreate that space that is on the record. So now you hear everything coming together, and you hear the space on the reverb. One of the main things about the reverb is I'm using quite a fair bit of pre-delay. So I'm still getting the attack and the sound before it hits those reverb and it creates that space afterwards. Again, it's quite important. The more reverb you put, you, you, the, the pre-delays are becoming crucial. Otherwise, everything is washy and you start losing your transient, you, you start losing definition. And finally, on the bus, obviously, I've got the bus here going on. Everything goes to it, like I was saying before. What I really like about that, and we can try that together, but I'm going to bypass the compressor before. The drive is really nice. I don't feel this mix needs more harmonic distortion in this instance because I'm getting it from other places. But if you want it uh, as a quick thing, it's quite interesting. I'm missing as you can hear, the, the drive doesn't necessarily make it louder, it just makes it a little bit fuller, you know, which is by nature what the drive does. And I'm just trimming it a little bit. I would just want it to drive the bus overall a bit harder. Because again, one of the big features of the SSL, they worked really well when 
the whole master bus was driven a little bit more than it should. A lot of people like that sound anyway. Some of them may not, but personally, it's something I, I, I've always quite liked. And last, I'm using the SSL compressor again, very much part of the, of the sound of the SSL desk and why a lot of engineers used to like that desk. The compressor is known as the glue. As soon as you put it in, your bottom end goes a bit whoop, because <laughs> it's really, that's where it works first. Uh, but it brings that mix all together. Again, some engineers never liked that so much and ended up using other compressors. But for that purpose, I thought it worked really well. The way I'm using it is fairly slow attack because I don't want all my transient, you know, I've worked so hard on getting my transient and my drums to snap. The last thing you want is suddenly to kill everything. And we can demonstrate quickly here. Have a look. You see what happens? Super fast attack. Everything is starting to... And now I'm increasing the attack. And as you can see, I'm hitting no more than 2 dB reduction at the most. It's just bringing that gentle glue about it. But it leaves the transient through, keeping the, the punch of the track, and everything is gelling together. That technique is more kind of a, a gelling technique, if you like, when you compress your bus that way. About the bus, a lot of people say, oh, do you put a compressor on the bus? Is it not mastering? I think mixing... Processing the bus is very much part of mixing. It doesn't mean you're mastering. I'm not putting a limiter on it. The compressor on the mix bus really helps to shape your overall mix. I'm using that as part of my mix. After that, the mastering engineer can do his thing. Some people like to start with the bus straight away. Some people like to put it a little bit later. Different approach, different engineers. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. Is what works for you. Personally, I like to get my drums, my bass, a rough vocal, when I'm there, that's where I put my bus compressor. And then after that, I start feeding everything and shape the rest of my mix in the bus compressor with that in that order. So that's for me the, the kind of workflow that I'm using. Do you have any question? Yeah, please. Yes, so th the way I'm doing it, uh, and again, many people may, may do it differently. I'm personally using two kind of bus. There's one thing about the buses in Logic that you need to be aware. If you don't use a VCA group, but the normal buses, uh, I can demonstrate actually by doing that. You see all those strings, they're all going to the bus two. And that is my bus two here, okay? What it allows me to do, especially with strings, I try not to EQ individual strings. I like to EQ them as a whole. So they all go to bus two. However, something in logic that you need to be aware of, if I'm turning down my bus, a lot of the stuff still goes into the reverbs. Yeah. You see I've turned on the bus completely, but it still goes into the reverb. So you can't really use that as a leveler because suddenly you start putting down your strings, you still have the same amount going to your reverb, which is not what you want. So the reason I'm doing that is it's my bus, I'm EQing it, but I would never use that bus as a leveler. Then I group everything to a VCA fader. The VCA fader is exactly doing that. For me, it was a big saver when Logic finally introduced that VCA fader. It's something I'd been crying for <laughs> a long time. And if you listen to the VCA, the reverb disappears with it. So it behaves as a proper group this time around. <sighs> Just because in the analog world, I've always done it like that, I suppose. You could send back to the bus, to the bus as well, but then it's not really the way it works because if you think of it, the reverb goes back to the box, to the bus, sorry. So you're turning down your bus, you're sending everything, including your reverb. What you want is, that's not what you want. It's not quite the right way. You want the same amount that goes to the reverb. You want don't that to touch. You want to bring everything down together and the reverb to follow according to what goes in. So it's a more natural way to do it, in my opinion. Does it answer your, your question? Any other question for now? Yeah. That depends on engineers. Uh, I've seen engineers doing mix in six hours. 
I've seen some doing mixes over three, four days. Traditionally, when we used to be constrained by studio time, often it would be one day a mix, roughly. Would you, uh, I mean, Max and other engineers may... It depends on how complex. Just usually the budget would allow for, you know, one day a try. Unless you're working on a big record, you're doing the next Madonna record, and it's basically whenever the, re the, the record is ready. It's a big difference, obviously. So on a smaller budget, first new artist, often it's one day a track. If it's the single and you end up having 96, 100 tracks to mix, you probably do it in two days. These days, you guys work in the box. You can take the, the time you want. However, there's something to be said about making quick decisions. Um, a lot of engineers prefer, if, they, if they're not happy with their mix, they prefer to scrap it and restart from scratch again. because. Doing a mix is a bit like playing a, doing a take, doing a, a guitar take, a drum take. It's like it happens or it's not, it doesn't happen. And I, I like that philosophy of mixing a bit quicker, but then not being scared of suddenly saying, you know what, it's not working. Let's push down all the faders. Let's start again. And sometimes it's not, it's more because the balance is, some, is the biggest important part in mixing, more than compression and everything. It's about getting the right balance. So the, the, the song emotion I, is put across to the listeners. Yeah. Okay, so the way to do it in, in, uh, in logic, if you take about, well, let's, I'm going to take those, let's say I'm going to take those three fader because they don't have a VCA on those one. It was just a, the little sample. I didn't feel the need for it. The way to create it is you go there, you uh, select all your channel, so shift if they are next to each other, or Apple, and select the one you want. Control click, create VCA fader, and you've got a VCA fader for all those. As you can see here on those, they're showing up here, it shows as strings. The same way here, they show as drums. Any other question, guys? Yeah. Uh, as many as I can, really, but I've got two systems at home where I've got my NS10 and another pair of speakers, but then the car, headphones, the more, the more, the more system I can check, the better, because it's just about having that confidence that it translates on every single system. Thank you, everyone.